Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text for today is from the 18th chapter of Luke's Gospel, verses 9 through 14. And please rise as we hear those words again in Jesus' name. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. You may be seated. During the years of his earthly ministry, Jesus showed that he was willing to interact with and speak to essentially everyone. But not everyone who met Jesus and heard what he had to say believed in him. There were many people who, even after hearing Jesus preach and perform miracles, refused to believe that he was the long-promised Messiah. And this unbelief was not because all these people rejected the whole idea of a, of a Messiah. Rather, they didn't believe in Jesus because he was not the kind of Messiah that they wanted. A good number of these people who didn't believe in Jesus were from the Jewish sect known as the Pharisees. The Pharisees were very outwardly pious. They always tried their very best to live their lives according to God's law. But along with trying to live according to the law, the Pharisees actually believed that they could do so, that their pious efforts were enough. Many people looked up to the Pharisees, both for their knowledge and for their piety, and the Pharisees looked down on those whom they believed were more sinful than they were, people like tax collectors. The tax collectors in Jesus' time did not only work for the local Jewish authorities, they also worked for the Roman government. And what the Romans did is that they allowed those who served as tax collectors for them to collect more taxes than they actually needed to, with the idea that the tax collectors would support themselves with this extra money. Now, surprisingly, pretty much everyone in Jewish society hated these tax collectors. Jewish freedom fighters called zealots viewed them as traitorous collaborators and, you know, enemies of their own people. While many pious Jews, like the Pharisees, hated the tax collectors because they lived their lives in such an openly Gentile way. Now this common perception was why Jesus chose these two hypothetical people to make his point in our gospel for today. If you wanted to find two people on the opposite ends of the spectrum of outward righteousness, then you would choose a Pharisee and a tax collector. Now, if we look at these two men in the parable, we see that they were not different in every single way. For one thing, both of these men professed to believe in God, and second, they had both come to the temple to pray. But we also see that in their humility and what they asked of God, and from what they drew comfort, these two men could not have been more different. To put it quite simply, the Pharisee wasn't humble at all. We see this in how he carried himself and spoke in God's house. And not only this, but the Pharisee actually derived satisfaction from pointing out that he was better than other people. He even pointed out the tax collector, someone who was in the same room as him, probably within earshot, as someone who was his inferior. The tax collector, on the other hand, was very humble. He didn't puff out his chest and look God in the face, so to speak, like the Pharisee did. And when the tax collector prayed, he didn't talk about how good he was, either in God's sight or compared to other people. The tax collector 
knew that he was a sinner, and that it didn't matter one bit how his sinfulness compared to that of others. The inequality of humility in these two men wasn't because one of them was more outwardly sinful than the other. They were unequally humble because of the source of their humility. Nothing the Pharisee was thanking God for was actually in itself bad. There is nothing wrong with trying to avoid sin, or faithfully giving to God's church, or trying to not live an openly sinful lifestyle. But the Pharisee believed that his being less sinful than others meant that he was less of a sinner to God. And this is why the Pharisee was not humble. The source of his humility, if he had any, was how he compared himself to other people. And his conclusion in this comparison was that he shouldn't be humble. He was exalted before God and should be proud. But the tax collector didn't think like this at all. His humility was not based on the subjective comparison to how he compared to others, as if he would be more or less humble depending on who else was in the room. The tax collector got his humility from the objective standards of who God is, what God is like, and what God demands that we be like. God has not told us to be less sinful than other people, to make sure that we avoid committing those very big, embarrassing sins. God has told us, here is the whole of my law. Do not transgress it on any point. That was where the tax collector got his humility, from the divinely given knowledge that he was a sinner, and that because of this, he did not deserve to receive anything from God except judgment and punishment. Now the Pharisee, with how he lived his life, could have been just as humble as the tax collector. Neither he nor anyone else is evil for striving to live their life according to God's law. But the Pharisee got whatever humility he might have had, not from God, but from himself. And because of this, he believed that he was righteous. Because when he compared his life to the lives of others, he saw that he had fewer sins that needed to be forgiven. Of course, the difference in humility in these two men carried over to what they said to God and what they asked of him. The Pharisee, because he believed that his standing before God depended on his standing before men, didn't really ask anything from God. All he prayed to God was to thank him for how good he was, as if the eternal well-being of his soul meant that he had to just maintain his personal current level of righteousness. So he was essentially praying, God, I thank you for who I am. Give me more of what I deserve. But the tax collector didn't want any of what he deserved. He didn't want to see one bit of that. This was because the tax collector knew he was a sinner, not compared to men, mind you, but compared to God. And that because he was a sinner, he didn't deserve anything good from God. So instead of asking God for what he deserved, the tax collector instead asked God to show him mercy. Just from looking at these two people back then, and maybe people like them today, we would assume that the man who went home justified was the Pharisee, not the traitorous, collaborating tax collector. This is what those to whom Jesus was speaking would have thought. This is even what his own disciples would have assumed. But it was not the Pharisee who went home justified in God's sight, but rather the sinner who had begged Beg God to show him mercy. As Jesus says, everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. If we believe that we ourselves are righteous and holy, and we ask God to deal with us according to what we deserve, then he will. God is not going to force his grace and forgiveness down our throats. If people, in pride and unbelief, ask God to throw the book of his justice at them, he will. He won't like doing it, but God will give the prideful the fair judgment for which they ask. On the other hand, those who are humble before God are not saved by this humility. Instead, those who have been humbled and laid low 
by God through the demands and condemnations of his law have had their hands emptied of themselves and their own merits so that they can then use their hands to cling to Jesus. Unlike us, Jesus had every reason to be prideful. Not only was Jesus genuinely without sin, but he was also the eternally begotten Son of God, equal to the Father and the Holy Spirit in every instance of power and glory. Yet for our sake, Jesus humbled himself to be born like us in human flesh and to live as one of us so that he could keep the law for us in our place according to the very same standards and conditions in which we live. And Jesus didn't only humble himself in being born and living. He humbled himself even further by taking all of our sin and guilt onto himself and bearing it when he suffered and died on the cross. Jesus suffered and died to pay the guilt of sin of every Pharisee and tax collector. He died to pay for your sins. And you can know that they have been paid for because Jesus has risen from the dead and has ascended to the right hand of God the Father. Jesus did not come into our world as an example of goodness, another divinely given illustration of the law which we must now follow drearily and unsuccessfully until our deaths. Jesus did not show us what we must now do. Jesus and his gospel shows us what he has done and what now by faith is being done in us to reconcile us to God now and forever. This is why when we are asked how we know that we are forgiven of our sins and saved, and that one day we're going to enter heaven, we don't point to anything about ourselves or that we do. Instead, we point to Jesus and his cross and empty tomb as the proof and foundation for everything that we believe and do. We know that for Jesus' sake, God the Father is not going to give us what we deserve. We know that one day we are going to see Jesus with our own two eyes, and that when that day comes, we are going to be completely at peace. But God's love and mercy is not only something that we are looking forward to. We have God's love and forgiveness right now, in those ways in which we are told about Jesus, and then are brought to faith in Him and what He has done. As St. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, we are first made part of Jesus and his death and resurrection through the water and the word in our baptisms. And then, through the gospel, in God's forgiveness and in receiving Christ's true body and blood in the supper, our grasp is kept firmly on Jesus through all the trials and temptations that we face in life. In his means of grace, God makes us so aware and confident in Jesus and his merits that we are made indifferent to our own. As St. Paul wrote in our epistle, when we as Christians use the, God, the gifts God has given us and we work hard, and even when we accomplish great and impressive things, our faith serves as a shield against pride and arrogance. Because we know the good that we do isn't from us, but is from the grace of God that is in us. God tells us that those who are humble will be exalted. And God promises to do this for us through his word, keeping us humble. At those times when we again fall back into wanting to lay hold to ourselves and of what we can do, God is going to do what is best for us through his law and knock that pride right out of our hands. But then, when God has again made our hands empty of ourselves, he will put Jesus right back into it, so that we can again cling to him and let him carry us by his gospel, so that at the end of our lives, when we leave this world, what Jesus said of the tax collector will be said of us too. Truly I say to you, this one went home justified before God. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding Keep your hearts and minds through faith. Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.